Bible this morning together. And uh, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. And uh, only three times, brethren, in the Bible do we see this greeting here. Three times that Paul does. Generally what you see is you see mercy and peace. Here he's giving all three to, to, to young Timothy. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God whom I served from my forefathers with a pure conscience. That without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Verse 4, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in thee also. Let's pray together. Father, again, we come before you this morning thanking you for the Bible, thanking you for your word this morning. and Father, thanking you for the privilege that we have to um, preach concerning motherhood and, and mothers and, and women in the church. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for your clear instructions. Thank you for your clear direction. And uh, Lord, we, um, we endeavor, uh, even in our frailties, to, to follow the word of God. And Father, we pray this morning that the Holy Spirit will speak through the words of Holy Writ to our ears that we might hear. And Father, again, thank you for this wonderful institution, this wonderful creation of God motherhood and we ask and pray these things now in Jesus name and all God's people said amen all right well you may be seated this morning and uh, I like what one pastor said concerning motherhood he said this motherhood is not merely a biological function and I think this is what's missing brethren so much nowadays amen Motherhood is not merely a biological function, no more than being a father is a mere biological function. God has instilled so much more into these wonderful roles that he's given us, brother. It's an amazing thing. Motherhood is, in fact, an attitude and a mindset of love and sacrifice and nurturing in which God himself has woven into the very fabric of women. It's the most amazing creation, as we know, when Adam fell asleep, amen, and, and uh, God took the rib and he created this wonderful woman, this wonderful creature, so much different than, he, than himself, and yet such a wonderful help meet as he brought them together. It's an amazing thing. In fact, John MacArthur said this, moms, beware, beware, he said, there are so many who would capture your interest today to tear you away from God's calling on your life. Beware, moms, he said, amen. He said the world's focus is to, for them to focus on their careers. Beware, moms, beware, amen. To buy more stuff, to pamper yourself more. And this is really the ideology and the teaching that is an antith antithesis to the word of God concerning moms and mothers. In fact, you're probably like me. You maybe heard this story. This is how crazy things get, brother. Listen, this is how crazy this stuff gets. A mom, just a couple of years ago, came to her husband. She had three children. Comes to her husband and says, I think God's calling me to the mission field. I'm going to the mission field. Now, brother, I can promise you from holy writ and from the depths of God's heart, God would not call a mother away from her husband and from her children to go to some mission field somewhere else. That was not of God. But this is the crazy, nutty stuff that goes on, brethren. You get away from holy writ. It's an amazing thing. Charles Spurgeon said this. and uh, He said this, Moms, listen. You are as much serving God and looking after your own children and training them up in God's fear, amen, and minding the house and making your household a church of God. God's not calling you away from your mission field, which is right in your home already, in your children already, amen? As you would be if you've been called to lead an army of battle for the Lord of hosts. This is a wonderful thing that God has created. This, this thing called motherhood, this thing called being a mom, is a most wonderful thing. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3, 
verse 20. The Bible says this, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, amen, because she was the mother of all living, the Bible says. Now, Eve's name literally means life giver. This is an amazing thing. If you look in Scripture, we don't have time, time to go there, but you'll see that her name was changed because in Genesis 2, it was Adam. They were both called Adam. And Adam changes her name here to Eve, which means the life giver, mother of all the living. This is what he changed her name to. Now, Eve, of course, brother, as we know, was a, a woman of first. And I just want to give us a couple this morning because of her, because of her, amen, we're all here this morning out of her loins, if you will, out of Adam and her loins. She was the first woman created by God. We know that, obviously. Amen. She was the first and only woman, listen, to not have a sin nature. Think of that for a moment. Amen. Not having a sin nature. She's the only woman, the first woman to have that happen. She, of course, was the first woman to live on earth. She was the first woman to be called a wife. There's so many things. Amen. She was the first woman to be assailed and beguiled by the serpent himself. And this is important, brethren. She was the first woman to be beguiled by him. She was the first woman to give birth to the first child ever born. She was the first sinner, listen, who saw the fruit of her sin as she stood at the first graveside as she buried her child. Think of that for a moment. She is a woman of first. Things that took place. And now, brother, listen, and praise God this morning. Listen, she is also the first woman to hear that wonderful prophecy of the cross after she repented and, and confessed of her sin she heard God say this listen to this brethren it's an amazing thing he said this to the old serpent I will put enmity between you thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel and with this first promise of our Redeemer begins brethren the scarlet road that is followed along to our Savior's lineage it's an amazing thing when you think about that. And it's interesting that that road followed along. Here Eve, the first to hear this, and death came because of what she, she, her and Adam did. It ended, brother, listen, at another grave, at an empty grave of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's where it ended. This is what she was first to hear. Think of that, brother, and the importance of that, that she would hear God utter such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And from Eve... The first mother of all living. We find in Holy Writ, again, a long line, a long lineage of godly women whom God ordained and used for his glory and purposes. Just to name a few, very familiar ones, I'm sure. We all remember Sarah, amen, the faithful wife of Abraham. Think of this, the mother of Isaac. Listen, and out of him came the nation of Israel. Think of that for a moment. As the sea, the Bible says, God said to Abraham, as the sand is by the seashore, so you shall your descendants be. And through this woman, Sarah, this faithful woman, we see the nation of Israel born. It's quite an amazing thing. Then there's Jacobed. I'm sure we're familiar with her, amen? The mother of Moses, whom God, think of this for a moment, whom God used to avoid the slaughter of the Hebrew boys, of the dictate of the king, takes him, puts him in a ark filled with pitch, and I don't have time to go there, but we could, puts him and floats him down the Nile River. And God purposely and ordained that he would be found by Pharaoh's daughter, amen, that he would be raised up in Pharaoh's own home. And then, listen, God ordained his own mother to come and to be his nurse and to care for him. Think of this. These wonderful women, these wonderful godly women that we see in Scripture over and over and over again. And of course, we know God used Moses, amen, to lead, take the nation of Israel and lead them out of slavery. What an amazing thing God did. Of course, we remember Elizabeth, right? And as we get into the book of Luke, we remember Elizabeth who God used to bring forth John the Baptist. Amen? This wonderful godly woman who was barren and, and she was with child. She brings forth the man who would preach the way. He would prepare the way for our coming Savior. And of course, last, last but certainly not least, and many others in, in the Bible, brethren, we think of Mary, whom God used to bring forth our Messiah. 
Think of that for a moment, brother. All of these godly women that God has used, and many others that we don't have time this morning to even speak of, but there are many in holy writ, and I'm thankful this morning that God would do such a wonderful thing for you and I. Well, we come this morning to the book of 2 Timothy. And as I always do, I like to lay some groundwork for us, brother, and, and, and we're going to lead it up to verses 4 and 5 concerning these two other godly women that God would use in holy writ, amen, to pass their faith on down. We talked about it a little bit in Sunday school this morning. It's an amazing thing, brother. The idea of mothers, the influence and the impact that they have on their children and passing that faith on down to the next generation. You are very influential as a mother. Now, in Timothy, 2 Timothy in particular, was written from the Maramine prison, which is still there today. You can actually go and see the prison that Rome, or excuse me, that Paul was in. He was held in this prison writing this book. Now, what's wonderful and amazing about this is that Paul was put in prison, amen? He spent a lot of time there. You know what God did when he was in prison? It's an amazing thing. Because he was a Roman citizen, Amen? He could not be fed to the lions, nor could he be crucified because he was a Roman citizen. So you know what God did? Puts him in a prison, in this Merrimite prison, and he sits there and he begins to write under the inspiration of God these letters to us. It is an amazing thing what God does. And we see here Paul, as he's sitting here in this cold, damp, dark dungeon. Hey, brother, the prison he was in is not like the ones we have today. Amen? <laughs> I mean, he was there in that dark. And this tender-hearted apostle, listen, this is so amazing. Paul, this man who had just run this long race, been through so many things, persecuted and stoned and all these things, let down in a basket, all these things. He's drawing near the end of this wonderful race that God had ordained for him to go on. And we see here again his final words as he begins to make his appeal to Timothy and to the church and saying, brethren, these are my last words. Please adhere to them. Please listen to them. And he addresses something very, very wonderful and just interesting here in verse number one. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. And I'm just going to kind of hit some waves here to get to, to verses 4 and 5. But I, I really want to lay this out for us, brother. The importance, this relationship that Paul had with Timothy is so needful, brethren. And then it gets shifted, as we see, over to his mother and grandmother that is spoken of here. Look at what the Bible says there. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And again, that is simply Paul addressing the sovereignty of God. It was God's will that I become an apostle. He's going to send me out with the gospel message. So that's very simple, very easy to understand. But this is important here in verse number one. He says, according to the promise of what? Life, which is in Christ Jesus. We see here this morning, brother, in Paul's purpose for preaching the gospel. The message of a living Savior. This is what he's saying. There's life in Christ. There's spiritual life in Christ. Listen, he preaches the Christ, the living Christ, so that men who are spiritually dead, which we all are, can experience this wonderful life that he's going to speak about. In fact, brother, the Apostle Paul references this life several times in this epistle. It's an amazing thing. He starts out here in verse 1. He says, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10 of the same chapter. Again, his concern, brother, this spiritual life, spiritual well-being. Look at verse number 10. Look what he says. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought what? Life and immortality. You see that there, to light through the gospel. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 10. Again, this is a main theme and a concern of his as he's preaching this life-giving Savior to the lost people. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 2. Look at verse number 10. He says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also, what? Live with him. Again, the idea here is a living Savior. We're born again into the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're given life, eternal life in Christ. And he says there, if we shall be dead with him, we shall also live with him. It's an amazing thing. In fact, I, I like what one 
commentary said concerning that verse. It's according to the divine purpose of God that life which is in Christ Jesus alone in all of eternity should be gifted to us, his sheep. What an amazing thing, brethren, that Paul would be concerned. He opens this book right here with this idea of a living Savior, and he preaches the living Savior to the very end, to the dying end of his day. That was his concern for people. Now, look what he does here. He first preaches about this life-giving Savior here in verse number one. And I want you to see this wonderful relationship. And I wish I had time because if, if you had time to drill down, you will see the number of times that Timothy and Paul were together. It's an amazing thing, brethren. He was with him in Ephesus. He was with him in so many places. He was with him while he was writing some of his epistles. We see this in Scripture over and over again, this wonderful relationship. Look what he says concerning Timothy. He says, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, our Lord. What's interesting here, brethren, and we're going to look at this, is this. Paul here is speaking, if you will, from the heart of a man who never had a physical son. Paul never had any children. He never had a physical son. So Paul has this enduring love for Timothy as a father. He says, I'm speaking to you, Timothy, young Timothy, as a son. Now get a load of this. He's speaking to Timothy as a father for a son to a young man who never had a spiritual father. Think of that for a moment. Timothy's father was dead. Here's Paul saying, my beloved son, you're an endearing son to me. You're like a son. And Timothy's going, amen, and you're like a father to me, the one I never had. So we see Paul here with his enduring love for his son, Timothy. And look at this here, if you would. Just a couple of passages. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn with me there, if you would, as we see this enduring love. And this is important as we get into the influence that his mother and grandmother had. We see this relationship that, uh, that's being fulfilled here by the Apostle Paul to his young son, if you will, using these enduring terms. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says there, or 17, I'm sorry. I looked at 7 of them. That ain't right. Look at verse number 17. Verse 16. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Amen. For this cause I sent to you, who? Timotheus, who is my beloved son. Do you see that? And faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. And so again, he's, he's commenting under the inspiration of God on this enduring relationship, this enduring love that he has for Timothy. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Just a couple of passages, brethren. And we'll, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Let's just flip over there again. And again, Paul here, under the inspiration of God, writes this. Look at verse 19. Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse number 19. Paul says this under the inspiration, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I may also be a, a good, a, of a good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, look what it says. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, you see this wonderful relationship that Timothy has with Paul? This literally a father and son kind of relationship that he has. He loves him so dearly as a, as a son. And he says, he served with me in the gospel. And so we see again here Paul's great concern and loving concern for this man called Timothy, whom in just a short while, brother, and as we know from chapter 4, his head will be removed. And he says, I have kept the faith. I have fought the fight. I have ran the good race. I have done what God's called me to do. And let me tell you, Timothy was going to see that. Timothy was going to know that. And Paul tells him here, you're just like a son to me. Carry on the faith, brother. Carry on the faith. This is exactly what he's saying, what he's doing there. Now, as a caring father... We'll start with the fathers, amen? This relationship, again, it's important for us. Look back at 2 Timothy... As a loving father, we see here a loving son. We see Paul, again, his great concern 
as he says this in verse number three. Look what he says there in verse number three. He says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a clear conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers. Listen, what? Night and day. Really what Paul is saying here, he's referencing his prayer habits. He's saying that a father who loves his son should be praying for his son night and day. His concern is for Timothy, again, knowing what's going to happen, because the Bible says that God told Paul that he revealed it to me that my life is almost over. It's almost done. That which God has made clear to me, Paul said. And so he knows, and he did it to Peter as well. Peter knew as well. But we see here Paul knowing full well the difficulties that he was going to face. It really is a figure reinforcing the idea that Paul is constantly remembering young Timothy in his prayers. I remember one time we were at the nursing home. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 2 real quickly again just to see this. And I ask the question, because one of the things you go, you know, when you, sometimes when you get into a nursing home, brethren, it's, it's kind of the last stage of things many times, amen? And you know what happens to them over there? They become extremely discouraged. They feel worthless, amen? I, I have no value, no worth anymore. I'm 80 years old, and, and how could God use me? And that's one of the things that we try and teach them when we go there, amen? There's much value that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here another aged lady, amen, with this same prayer habit that Paul had. Look at Luke chapter 2, look at verse number 36, a very familiar portion of scripture to all of us. The Bible says, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher, and she was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, which means 84 years, which devoted or departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers. What? Night and day. Listen, grandmothers. If you think you have no value and that you're not important, amen? Yes, you are. Even if you're sitting in a wheelchair, we know some brothers over there, right? Their legs are missing and things missing. This guy is incredible. He prays and he prays and he prays. No legs. Sitting there, can't hardly get around by himself, but he has taken on that role as a grandfather for his grandchildren to pray for them. It's an amazing thing, brother. Yes, you are valuable more valuable than you can even begin to imagine. In fact, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, just flip over there. Let's just look at that real quickly. Again, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. Look who shows up as Paul is writing this letter. He says there, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, there he is, amen, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now look at verse 9, look what Paul says. Here Timotheus is being introduced. We sent him to you, guys, this minister, and look what he says there in verse 9. He says that, for what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherefore with we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that ye might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Here we again see Timotheus being sent out, this son of Paul, his, his adopted son, if you will, being sent out. And Paul says, man, we are just praying day and night for you. This is what Paul says. Isn't it wonderful to know? I bet you I could have several of you get up here and give a testimony. I can give one concerning my own grandmother. My own grandmother, who's been with the Lord now for several years. She sent me a holy Bible in 1977. And she wrote in the cover of that thing and said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Do you know that was 10 years before God saved me? She was a praying grandmother for her grandchildren, brethren, night and day. Man, 
this is an area, I'll be honest, that we are probably all lacking. Praying, praying, praying. Joel Beakey, in one of his books, I didn't write it down, but I read it. He said, you know that at, at, at our prayer meetings and at our homes, when we're sitting in our home, that the prayer that we do once another, it's a, it's a spiritual meter. He called it a spiritual meter. It tells you where you were at. Your prayer life says a lot about who we are and our dependence upon God. It's an amazing thing. And I'll tell you, this is an area that Paul certainly, certainly enforces that or undergirds that with him doing and praying for that. In fact, there's about 650 prayers recorded in the Bible. Roughly about 650 of them. And you know what? We get the answers to 450 of them. It's, it's an amazing thing. It really is. You just sit and look through Scripture and you see that. These prayers that are uttered under the inspiration of God. And God says, yes, I will answer it this way. It's an amazing thing, brother. May, may that be an encouragement to all of us. Now look at the, the next thing there in verse number 4. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1. Look at verse number 4. So he speaks of his son. and He speaks of this love that he has for him. And he's praying for him night and day. And then he says this. And this is important. This is something that really um, that really hit me. I don't know. I'm just first Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is something that, brethren, I think we all need. That we're, that we're so needful of. Look at verse number 4. Look what he says there. I'm praying night and day. He says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with what? joy. Paul here again, knowing that his service to the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to an end. God has revealed this. He knew the difficulties that certainly that Timothy would face. It's an amazing thing. Now let me give you this. Tears filled with joy. This is very important, brethren, that we have a biblical definition of what Paul is saying here. Let me read this. Secular dictionaries define joy as an emotion evoked by well-being. Amen? Success or an emotion evoked by a prospect of possessing what one desires. That is what a secular dictionary defines joy as. The word Paul uses here, though, as it always is, is much different than that. This is a biblical joy. And this is one, brother, that we need to cling on to and cleave on to for sure. Amen? It means a deep down sense of well-being. <laughs> Hey, Timothy, I pray that my joy will be fulfilled. And the kind of joy is this deep down inside sense of well-being. It literally means a calm delight. Listen, which is not an experience that comes from favorable circumstances, but occurs even when the circumstances are at the most painful and severe. This, brother, is what we need as Christians. Amen? We need that kind of joy, that kind of trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a lot of bad things that happen. The devil hates you and he hates me. And he uses discouragement. He does all kinds of things. Listen, you can't base your joy on your emotions and what happens. I always tell the story. I remember when I worked for Ecolab years ago. There was a restaurant we had in town here. Every time I go in there, the manager was either on a high or he was on a low. He was on a high if he thought God gave him something that month or God did something that week that he saw. If he didn't see God doing anything, he was on a low. His joy was gone. No, brethren, that's not what Paul is saying. He's saying this joy that I have <clears throat> is much deeper than that. This joy I have comes from the Lord. It's from the Lord God himself. Let me show you that this is the kind of joy, brethren, that we should <clears throat> pray for, that we need in our families, in our homes, and in our churches. This kind of joy. Look at Nehemiah. Look at the book of Nehemiah. This joy is much more than an emotion. And it's okay to be emotional. I, I like to be joyful. I like to be happy. But I want to have a solid foundation for the joy that we're talking about here. Look at Nehemiah. Chapter 8, look at verse number 10. Nehemiah chapter 8, 
verse number 10. And we know just before this, they had lost the word of God. I mean, do you understand the depth of what they had fallen? They find the, the Pentateuch, they find the word, and, and Nehemiah reads it for several hours in the morning and the evening, and he's reading it to the people, and they realize, oh my goodness, we have fallen so far. And look what he says here. Well, let's just do verse number eight. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. Now that word distinctly means explaining and translating. So he was reading the word of God and he was translating it to them so they understood it, which is what pastors are supposed to do and elders are supposed to do. And gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tricia, and Ezra the priest scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God, mourn not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. They were so upset, so, so um, in such a tizzy because they had moved so far away from the word of God. Listen to what he says. Look at verse number 10. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be sorry. For the what? Joy of the Lord is our strength. This is what Paul's talking about. This is the kind of joy that we need, brethren. That kind which is found in the Lord. That which is, is something that can't be taken away from us, brethren. You know your circumstances. When you have the joy of your circumstance, when your circumstance changes, that kind of joy goes. Not this kind. Look at one more with me. Look at John. Look at what the Lord Jesus Christ himself said. Look at John chapter 16. Right before his high priestly prayer, he's teaching his disciples. John chapter 16. Look at verse number 20 just to, just to give you an idea. The Bible says there in verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into what? Joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Listen, look at verse 22. And ye know therefore, and ye now therefore have sorrow. But when I see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your what? Joy, no man what? Taketh from you. This is the joy, brethren. This is what he's talking about. In fact, if you read on there, verse 23, he says, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. He will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. This, brethren, is the kind of joy that he's talking about. Is he begins to lay this thing out there, this joy that he's going to speak of here in the next two verses, if you will. Listen, I like this. Joy is God's gift to his sheep. It is more than just a mood. God's joy is full and complete. This is the idea. This is what he's speaking of this morning. Now, listen, he's going to lay into it in verse number five here. And this really, we want to spend a little time. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 1 there. As he directs his attention to those to his mother and grandmother as he directs his attention to this which he brings to mind. Look at verse number five there. He says this. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. Now that word unfeigned, brethren, is that which is unhypocritical. It means that it's a genuine faith. It's without show or pretense. Listen, pretense is a claim made or implied but is not supported by any facts. Paul says it's an amazing thing. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, that genuine faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in thee also. So what we're seeing here, brother, we are seeing a generational faith that's being taught and, and passed down. We see grandma who had the Jew, this wonderful Jewish grandmother before she was saved taught her daughter these wonderful Jewish things before she was saved. And in turn, they taught their son Timothy these wonderful biblical truths. These ladies, mother and grandmother, 
were so influential in his life. Paul says, I want to bring that kind of joy to my remembrance, knowing the influence that took place there. It's an amazing thing. He enjoyed having a godly heritage which was passed down to him. Do we have any first-generation Christians in here this morning? I am. I'm a first-generation Christian. Amen? My parents were not Christians. My grandparents, apart from my grandmother, the one grandmother on my, dad, on my mom's side, none of them were Christians. Amen? It's an amazing thing. And it's amazing because that first generation of Christians, listen, it's, it becomes such a driving force when you know what you've been saved out of. You've come out of the darkness of the pit of hell, and it's such a valuable thing. And brethren, it's so important that we, as first generation Christians, pass that faith on down to our children. It is the most amazing thing when you understand that. Look at Acts chapter 16. I want to show you this, the importance, again, that his mother and grandmother played in his life. And again, it's Mother's Day, it's Grandmother's Day, it's Woman's Day, it's, it's, it's a day for the ladies, because these biblical principles, brethren, they lay on top of all of us, actually, but these two wonderful women, these wonderful ladies, are called out by Paul himself under the inspiration of God, and names them and for all of eternity, their names will be there listed as a mother and a grandmother who pass down that faith. Wow, look at verse number 1, Acts 16, concerning Timothy's father. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple there was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, that's his mother, that's who they're talking about, and believed, but his father was a what? A Greek. So we see here that even his father wasn't even a believer anyway, but we see here again that his mother believed. And so we see God taking his mother from this man, and, and, and historically he's not mentioned again, so many believe, as Joseph is not mentioned again, that he had passed on. But he's mentioned here as a Greek, so he wasn't even saved in the first place. It was God using his mother and calling her to pass this faith on down. Look at verse Number, number two, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium, him would Paul give to go forth with him. And he took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a what? Was a Greek. And so we see here, brethren, again, Timothy's father was not even saved. He was, a, he was, a, he was a, basically a pagan, an uncircumcised pagan. And God took this wonderful mother and had her believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was saved through that preaching of the word. You know, in Proverbs, we said it this morning, brethren, listen, in Proverbs, when the Bible says, amen, to train up a child in the way which he should go, and this is, brother, you want to know when I really started to believe in the sovereignty of God? When my children begin to grow up, they all grew up under the same teaching, they all grew up under the same roof, they all grew up under all these things together, amen? And we realize that it's not us that saves them. God does. God saves them. All we can do is what Proverbs says. Hey, pass that on down. Mom, in the home, when you're there, teaching them day after day. We get around. I get up in the morning and I leave. And there's Wendy and our children sitting around the table learning the knowledge and fear of God. You moms are so important in that area. So needful. So very Needful, it really is. Look at Proverbs 6. Let's just look at a couple of them here concerning the importance of a mother and a father. I'm not saying the father's not important. They are. See, that's how God designed it. Even though sometimes, because of men who are bums, men who are infidels, they will leave their family and leave the mom with no choice. Leaves them there stuck. What a bunch of fooey. Look at uh, Proverbs 6. Look at verse number 22. Look what the Bible says there. Well, verse 20. Okay, so I'll go up. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. 
verse 25. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So we see here again the author of Proverbs here in his wisdom, giving wisdom. He's warning the son, keep the father's commandments. That is a positive, look what he says about mom, forsake not, keep and don't forsake the law of thy mother. If your parents are Christians and they're teaching you the Bible, holy writ, you obey your parents. Amen? Do not forsake that which they are trying to help you with. You know, isn't it funny how smart we are when we're children? And we, we turn to be about 16 years old. Anybody ever seen that? 16, 17, all of a sudden we are smarter than everybody that's ever lived and existed. For some reason, that happens to some. And moms and dads who are godly people are simply trying to teach you the right way. Amen? That's what they're trying to do. This is what part of the role of what mom does. Look at Proverbs 10. Look at Proverbs 10, verse number 1. Look again. Solomon says, under the inspiration, The Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the what? Heaviness of his mother, a grief to his mother. You see that there? The importance of obeying your parents and your mother with the influence that she has. Look at Proverbs 30, just one more here. Again, I think very familiar portions of Holy Writ to us this morning. Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Look at verse number 17. Again, the father's mentioned and the mother's mentioned. Look at here what it says. The eye that mocketh his father and despiseth to obey his what? Mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. We see here, brethren, again, the warning to our children, amen, the influence of a godly mother and a godly father. But the mother there, you see, is just singled out because the dad normally is off working, amen? Mom's the one home with them, training them up in, in most of the day. Dad does that when he gets home or in the morning before he leaves. That's why, listen, can I say this? I'm going to get in trouble and I don't even care. Okay? That's why when you send your children off to the public school. Oh, here he goes. That's why when you send them off for eight or nine hours, you better be in front of them. Because you ain't going to come back eight hours with ten minutes of Bible study with your children. It isn't going to happen. You have great influence on them. Mom, Dad, you can't do it. You need to be very, very careful because I'm telling you right now, they will suck them in like the biggest black hole you've ever seen in your life. It's amazing. Paul says, or the author says here, hey, father and mother, that eye is going to get pecked out and eaten. Obey your parents. Obey your parents. It's an amazing thing. Now listen, let me close with this. All of us know that salvation cannot be inherited from believing parents. I think we know that, don't we? It's not an inherited thing. But we do see, listen, what we would call scripturally the household principle in scriptures. What do we mean by household principles in scripture? Glad you asked. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Turn with me to Deuteronomy. Let me show you this. You know what's interesting concerning the Jewish, the young Jewish women? You remember Hannah in the Bible? You remember Hannah? Hey, Hannah. Remember that? Remember Hannah in the Bible? Huh? Hannah's, what was Hannah grieved about? What was she concerned and grieved with? She couldn't have children. Children are a blessing from God. And what's more interesting is, and it all reverts back to that which their first mother heard when they heard the Lord God say, I'm going to put enmity between thy seed and her seed. The Jewish mother was praying, wanting to have a child in the lineage of Christ. That promise that was made, there's, I, I always say, they're still looking for it. It's an amazing thing, the value that a young Jewish mother 
had. Look at here, look at the household principle in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And uh, look at verse number 9. It's a familiar passage of scripture, I'm sure, to all of us. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at verse number 9. Uh, verse 8, I'm sorry. Verse 7. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great and has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of thy life. Listen, here's the household principle. But teach them thy sons and thy what? Sons, sons. You understand what that is? That is a generational thing. In other words, you teach your sons and you teach that to the grandparent's son. It is a grandparent parent thing. This household thing continues to go on and on. In the Jewish life, that's what they did. They taught the grandchildren. The, parent, the grandparents didn't go to Arizona and sleep. They were there. They were teaching their own children and then their grandchildren. That's what I always tell the older people. Retirement's found nowhere in Scripture. You do realize that is a Western cultural thing. It's not found anywhere. Anna was 84 years old. She didn't retire. She prayed. She prayed. She prayed. It's amazing, isn't it, how we churches, Christians, have adopted such worldly views concerning children, concerning their roles as grandparents, their roles as parents. It's stunning. And yet we see here this wonderful principle that the Jewish men were told, this household principle, you teach them to your children, and the grandparents teach them. It is a generational thing, just like we saw in Timothy there. Look at Psalm 78. Look at Psalm 78, another, I'm sure, a very familiar portion of Scripture for us. Look at Psalm 78. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our, what? Fathers have told us. You see this here again. We're going to see this wonderful principle of them teaching God's law down through the generations. We have heard and have known, and our fathers have told us. Look at verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. And again, the importance. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make known to their what? To their children that the generation to come might know them. Do you see this, brethren? Even the children which should be born, they aren't even born yet. He's saying this generational thing must carry on. Who should arise and declare them to their children? Listen, verse 7, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commands. Brethren, that is a household principle. That is a teaching that is in holy writ. We see it in Deuteronomy. We see it here uh, in the book of Psalms. We see it in 2 Timothy as grandma and mom played this important role in their children. Let me close with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. He said this, Grace does not run in the blood, but it often runs side by side with it. In other words, what he's saying is, you as a father, you as a mother, you as a grandmother, amen? Great influence, great influence. I just want to thank our moms this morning and our grandmothers for being faithful teachers of the word of God to your children. The impact is in, it just unbelievable the impact that you have and the role, the responsibility that God has given to you as a mom 
as a grandmom, as a father and a grandfather. These principles apply to all of us. The importance of that, we talked about it as I closed this morning, even in Sunday school. God brought a catastrophic flood on the whole world in Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 7. They were only 10 generations away from Adam. Do you see the importance of that? 10 generations is not very far away. And in that time, they had moved away. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5, that God saw the wickedness that was upon the earth. And that he saw that their wickedness was only continual, only evil continually. Every thought they had, everything they did was evil. Mothers. Fathers. Mothers. Grandmothers. The impact you have upon your children and your grandchildren cannot be overspoken because God himself says that it's very, very important and needful. Amen? This is what God says. It's a generational thing. Let's pray together. Father, we, <clears throat> we conclude with the hearing of your word this morning with a, a most solemn uh, wonderment, I guess is the word I would use. Knowing that you know, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But as moms and grandmothers, we can certainly see from Holy Writ the impact, the spiritual impact that they have on their children and grandchildren. And Father, we thank you this morning for the clear direction in your word. And Father, I want to pray for all of us this morning that we will take to heed this practical teaching, that we will sink it deep down in our ears that we might act upon it, that we might with much seriousness understand that which you've called us to do. <coughs> Father, may we act on it. Lord, again, I thank you for our moms and our grandmothers and the privilege we've had to hear from Holy Writ concerning them. Just a little snippet. There's so much. And Father, we again thank you for this wonderful creation. Moms and motherhood. And of course, fathers and fatherhood. But thank you again. We ask and pray all these mighty things in your mighty name. The Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said.